All right, it is 12, so we will go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for Coaching the Tech Coaches Workshop. This is the fourth digital event that we've hosted in our Tech Coach Con series. I'm really excited for this one. It's our first interactive workshop. So you can go ahead and download the event worksheet. I know we had some issues with the link in the email you got this morning. Apologies for that, but that link um, in the slide that you're seeing should work. I also posted it in the chat so that everyone um, has access to it throughout the event. It'll be up throughout this whole intro in case you're joining us late so you can download it um, while I'm kind of going through some housekeeping. I'm really excited for today's event. Um, like I said, it's our first interactive workshop. And I think also with the uncertainty of next semester and fall 2020, um, it's a really good time to think about how we can maximize this time to reflect on the last semester, how remote learning went, and uh, kind of use this time to prepare for any scenario that presents itself in the fall. So without further ado, um, I'm going to jump into some housekeeping and then we'll get started with the event. Um, today we're going to be talking about gathering internal feedback from stakeholders like teachers, administrators, uh, students, and parents. We're going to talk about leveraging and building an external PLN using social media. And then we're going to talk about taking both of those categories and kind of putting them together to plan for the fall. So before we jump in, I just want to let everyone know where you can find Dino resources in case you're looking for more remote learning resources or things to get you prepared for the fall. Um, our Tackling Tech podcast is a great resource. Brett McGrath, our VP of Marketing, is having conversations on there every week with tech coaches, um, administrators, teachers from all over uh, to learn how they're tackling tech in their schools and districts. Um, our blog is a great resource as well. We're sharing stories, uh, resources, worksheets, everything you can imagine on the blog every day. So we have great new things coming out there. Um, our Tech Coach Corner YouTube series is relatively new. I host that twice a week um, and we take tactics that are talked about on the podcast, dive a little bit deeper into those with our guests. Um, we had a great episode on SAMR with Katie Bond. We've talked about um, student teacher self-care with Scott Noons. We've had a couple episodes on the tech integration matrix. So are, there are some really good tactical things on there that you can use in your school or district. Um, and then last but not least, you are obviously familiar with the Tech Coach Con event series because you're joining us today. Um, so keep an eye out for our next tech, ne technology coaching conference events. Um, we will be having one probably at the end of August um, in anticipation of the next semester. Um, so feel free to keep an eye out for that and join us. And then we also have the Tech Coach Con Facebook group as an extension of these events events so that you can build your PLN after these events and in the interim before we have our next one and really engage with people who have commonalities to yourself going through the same challenges to learn from each other after attending these events. So what you can expect today um, in our workshop, we have a great uh, panel of experts joining us today. If you attended our 2020 Technology Coaching Conference, you'll be familiar with all of our panelists. Um, they all presented at our conference, so this kind of feels like we're taking it full circle and I'm really excited for our conversation today. So Katie Bond is joining us from Martin County Schools to talk about internal feedback. Scott Noons is joining us from Modesto City Schools to talk about leveraging PLNs and using social media to do so. And then Nicole Allman is joining us from Richland School District 2 to talk about future planning and how tech coaches can really be prepared for fall 2020, uh, whatever their circumstances may be. So I just want to run through a few uh, expectations for today. Like I said, um, it's interactive. So we would love for everyone to interact with us today in the workshop. And the best way to do that is through the worksheet that we've provided to you. So you can download the worksheet through this bit.ly. Um, CTC-worksheet is the bit.ly link. Um, we also encourage you to share your worksheet on Twitter and Instagram throughout the event and afterwards. We'd love to see what every, everyone got from the event and is kind of filling out on the worksheet. And if you share it on Instagram or Twitter, tag um, Dino and tag Tech Coach Con, you'll be entered in our event giveaway. So we'll be announcing that giveaway on Monday, um, but we really want to get people talking and engaged with us in this interactive workshop. So I know I'm doing a lot of talking, but last but not least, um, want to set just some expectations for what you can expect for us during the event as well as after. So 
As with all of our events, the live stream is being recorded and we will make it available to everyone who registered after the event. So even if you couldn't join us for the live event, we will still send you the link and that will be available on Monday. So everyone who registered will get a link with the recording on Monday and that will be available on our YouTube channel as well. So you can go there and view it. Um, you don't need to get the link to view it. Um, additionally, we have Q&A available during this event. So if you would like to submit a question for either myself about the event or for our panelists, feel free to do so through the Q&A tool. Um, we'll be answering all of those questions at the end. Um, so feel free to put those in throughout. We'll be monitoring it so that your questions aren't getting missed. And then we don't have chat available today during the webinar, but we would love for you all to kind of use the chat functionality in the TechCoachCon hashtag on Twitter um, and kind of get the conversation going there, share your worksheet once again, and put any thoughts, questions, um, discussion topics you've taken from today um, in that hashtag. We use it for all of our events and it's a great place to go back to to see what everyone got from the event, how everyone is talking about, uh, you know, practicing uh, different strategies going into the fall and kind of leveraging that PLN once again. And then lastly, um, we will provide a certificate of attendance for anyone who either attended the event live or watched the recording. When we send you the email with the link on Monday, you will also get a link to a Google form that you can fill out to request that certificate. So um, you can go ahead and, and request that whenever you like. If you watch the recording, it'll also be in the recording description so you can uh, request that. So without further ado, I think it is time to get started. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Katie, if you wanna turn your video on, um, I'd love to introduce you. So. Welcome everyone. Uh, today's gonna be a little bit different from our past events. We're gonna do kind of a mini session uh, type, type format. So Katie will be presenting on um, gathering internal feedback and that's the top section of your worksheet. So Katie, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, I'll pass it to you uh, so you can go ahead and jump in. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. So um, first of all, I work in Martin County School District, which is on the east coast of Florida. It's on the map on the screen there. Um, and so what we have done, um, what we did last year, let me start there. Last year in the spring, we jumped right into virtual instruction with, um, we used a learning management system and kind of just put a lot on the teachers to create a lot of stuff. Um, we had, um, designated times for them to zoom with our students and we kind of struggled through that because we couldn't really require it so there was a lot of lessons learned there so that's just kind of the background of what we did last year um, and i'll get into our plans so far for this coming year um, so there we go um, so this is how we felt last school year i think we all can uh identify with that that gif so that's actually um a little background on that gif that's like a couple miles from my friend's house in the Florida Keys at the last big hurricane that hit there. We deal with a lot of hurricanes in Florida, so it, it has a little personal touch to that because I know exactly where that guy's standing in the middle of the hurricane. Um, but so that's how it really felt last year for us, I think. Um, and so there was a lot to be learned. So the big things that we, um, when we talk about the lessons we learned in our district is um, we can't really trade what we normally do in person for what we do digitally. I can't just give a worksheet in a PDF and throw it on um, our learning management system. We use Google Classroom. Um, I can't just throw it on there and expect kids to be as engaged as in the classroom when I'm there helping them through it. Um, we, we need to set our expectations clearly in the beginning. Um, and that's something that we're really trying to set up for next year. Um, it was, you know, we were thrown into, into virtual learning pretty quickly last year, so it was tough to do that. You know, at the beginning of the school year, that's a, that's a whole different story. Um, some students actually did better at home than they would at school, and so there's a lot to really reflect on with that. Um, you know, what is it that the teacher had done that was good for some students than others? So um, that's something we've really looked at. Um, and I think we can all agree that our, our schools and everything else are going to be changed forever from this. And, and that's not necessarily bad. I think from a digital, I'm a digital learning specialist, from my perspective, there's so much that 
we, there were so many positives in my world that we're taking from this. The teachers were, I mean, it's, it was hard. It was, they were forced into this situation, but um, you know, it made them grow. And so we see so much room for growth to help our teachers because there's no more that excuse of, well, I've never used that before, or I don't even know what that looks like. Um, so we get past that huge hurdle that we see a lot of times when we're trying to help our teachers. Um, and so I think there was a lot of positive for us that we took out of that. And certainly not to say that we were happy COVID happened, but you know there was some positives to take out of it. So we gathered a lot of information um, from our stakeholders through some surveys. So we, at the end of the school year, um, we did some surveys. We did, we used Google Forms. Um, we did again about a month or so later to kind of get a feel for where our, our teachers and our uh, parents were. Um, and we're going to be doing that again now to have them choose what their, um, what their student's path is gonna be for next year. Um, so from those, what we heard from teachers and just from conversation, um, it was really difficult, <laughs> really difficult to jump into that virtual world. Um, they missed being with their students. That was something I heard a lot of. Uh, they certainly felt underprepared as all of us did in every part of our world, um, but they survived and it, it, was, it was really difficult. Um, so that's what we heard from teachers. And what we plan to do with this is, uh, in my department, we're, we're putting together tons of training and resources, um, both optional and, and required. And um, we, we really see that now that we're past that hurdle of how do I log in, hopefully for the most part, now we can really build on that and, and go deeper besides here's how to log in, here's how to post, here's how to send stuff to your kids, here's how to collect from your kids. Um, now we can go deeper into the to the pedagogy side of um, what's the best way to to teach students in this environment and how do I make my students engage more? Um, so there's a lot of training we're we're planning for. The resources we're creating really is for all those that still need that. How do I log in? Um, and, and so that there's videos for them to look at, there's gonna be um, written instructions of how to get that, but I don't need to spend my time as a coach. Um, I don't need to spend as much time teaching them how to click the right button as, and, and I could spend more time on that, building their instructional strategies, which is something that's really exciting for me. So from students and parents, um, we heard a wide range of things. We asked them, uh, how did it go, essentially, at the end of last school year? And we heard all kinds of things. Some, some, some parents had some great experience and students had great experience. Some felt like they had too much work to, be do, to do for their kid, child at that grade level. Some felt like they didn't get enough. Um, and ultimately, they needed a lot more support. Um, they need more support when they, they, some of them had never seen Google Classroom or had gone onto the the digital textbooks before. And so they, we heard that they also need some more support. So we're also working on building that for them. Um, and for next year, when we asked them about how they felt about next year, we heard everything. Um, either they will send their student to school, no questions asked. They will not send their student to school, no questions asked. Um, and some it's depending on masks. We have some really strong opinions in our, in our community about whether they should or should not be wearing masks in school. Um, so we're really trying to do our best to market our plans for next year and also um, really relying on our county health department in terms of the mask part. So um, we've had them speak specifically at our, at our school board meetings and, and that's broadcasted um, on YouTube so that everyone can watch it from home. Um, and so that's kind of how we've tackled that. We've currently uh, rested on um, two options. The state requires all Florida schools to open five days a week in person, um, despite our numbers climbing. And so um, we're, we're going to open five days a week if, if parents want it. And then our other option is they can just watch virtually, um, which we're, we're working out the details of now, but those are gonna be our two options for this school year moving forward. Um, we are requiring masks. That is something that the, the county health department has, has said we are going to have to use masks. 
Um, okay, so what do we do with this info? We have those, multi we have those two options for our families to choose. Um, they can move in and out of those options. So if they go to school and they feel sick or if they decide they're not comfortable, they can, they can switch over to virtual. There's no full you know, year long commitment. We're asking them to commit um, till part, we start August 11th and they're asking them to wait at least a month, I think it is, um, to decide if they wanna switch. Uh, just because the numbers aren't really going to change until we get that data. So there's, there's really not a point to, but uh, we're asking them to commit to for at least the first I think, month or so before it's switching. Um, and so we're also planning to provide resources to give to teachers so that they can share it with parents. So we're going to create videos and, and one pagers and written instructions so that our parents can have more information um, moving forward to help them through it as well. Um, so we also are trying to make consistencies. We heard from, and I'll get to administration, but we heard from administration that um, it was really inconsistent in terms of how some teachers set up their, their virtual instruction and how others did. And so we're, we're also working in our district to, um, to make those expectations as much as, as much as needed and as much as possible to make them consistent and clear to both teachers and to parents and students. Um, so yeah, that was what we heard from administrators. They they saw us, they they were often in uh, the virtual classrooms and saw huge um, huge inconsistencies. So we're trying to try to narrow that down. There's also some concerns about the loss of learning from last year, um, knowing that you know they didn't get as much as they would have gotten in person. And so what we did um, administratively is set up. Uh, virtual learning loss classes. We we use um, Edgenuity as our product for that. They had they had summer classes available where it was not credit based, but just um, to help with that. And then we also provided um, more resources beyond that to help as well. Um, and so, like I said, we're going to offer more to make the environment more consistent. Um, so for me, the big takeaway from all of the internal feedback that we got was that um, everyone needs a little more support and we're climbing a, a big a big mountain here a big <laughs> the visual is a big set of stairs um, and we need to we need to train for that we need to be more prepared as much as we can we're not being thrown into this as quickly and, and um, suddenly as we were so we're doing as much as we can with with our the manpower we have in our district to get as as much training and preparedness as we can to make it better than it was last year. Um, and, and for me, um, we also really need to think about feedback more frequently um, since this is so significantly different from what we're used to and it's going to continue to be. I think the feedback needs to be measured all the time. So if you're a teacher, you know, you should be gathering feedback throughout as much as, as much as possible, especially when you're doing something new, um, to see how it's going. Um, and from the from the district side, from the administrative side and coaching side, same thing. We still need to get we need to ask our teachers what they need and and meet those needs as much as we can. Um, and so, I think that was about all I had. I feel like I missed one major point. <laughs> um, that's okay. So that's what I had for gathering and the feedback and what we what we learned from it. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's really applicable. And, and I love that you shared what feedback you've gotten as well as kind of what your plan is taking that feedback and then continuing to, to gather feedback as the summer goes on and next semester begins. Um, so thank you, Katie, for sharing that. Um, if anyone has questions for Katie regarding feedback, comments, things like that, put them in the Q&A and we will answer those at the end. Um, so now I think we're going to jump into leveraging PLNs, specifically using uh, social media to build your PLN and strengthen your PLN. So Scott, if you want to turn your video on and we'll go ahead and get started with that. Um, everyone, this is Scott Noons from Modesto City Schools. Um, he did a presentation at our technology coaching conference in March on social media with Matthew Ketchum. So excited to hear what you have today, Scott. I will pass the floor to you. 
I'm super excited. Thanks for having me, Tara. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank Dino for this opportunity to share out on the power of the PLN. It's something that I'm super passionate about. Uh, it's greatly changed my life. And um, I want to share that with you. A uh, quick check. Can you see my presentation, Tara? I just want to confirm real quick before I get into yes. it. Yes, okay, you're good. Great. Thank you. And I'm just going to talk for a little bit, everyone. Go ahead. And if you would like to follow along or have your own copy of the presentation, it's there at that bit.ly uh, bit.ly backslash coach to coaches. And a little bit about me. I'm Scott Nunes. I'm an ed tech coach, a former ELA teacher uh, who just recently transitioned into this ed tech coach role. Uh, during COVID. So I started in March, officially started this month, uh, but they reeled me in a little bit earlier to help out because it was all hands on deck. Things have been a little bit chaotic, but we had a plan and uh, that's huge. And so we also need to have a plan for social media. So that's something I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to reference a quote that Eric Qualman has or he says the time to build a PLN is before you need it. And that's so true. So if you don't have one already, or you have a small one that you're wanting to expand, there's no time like the present. Um, the time is now essentially to get started on that. It's so important. And I'm going to go ahead and transition to the next slide. go. Uh, so you can follow me on Twitter at Mr. Noons Teach. Noons rhymes with tunes is always what I tell people uh, when they ask me how to pronounce my last name. It's the Portuguese version. Uh, so there's no tilde over the N and then there's no Z. There's an S. And then I'm also the host of two podcasts, the TNT Ed Tech podcast that I do with Matthew Ketchum. Uh, he's a former tech coach and now the tech director of our district. Um, so kudos to him on that endeavor. And I'm taking over his job. So we've both kind of moved up and we'll be working closely together on the podcast and also in person. Uh, he's a great guy. So make sure you follow him as well. He's on Twitter at Matthew Ed Tech Coach. And I also have education today. And right now I'm featuring a special series on women in education. So I'll have that also at the end that, uh, that way you can check it out. Uh, real quick, if you have the dino checklist, uh, here's my section. Uh, I'd encourage you to follow along and I'm going to follow this order uh, right here. Uh, so first, before we even begin, you have to establish a goal. Like, what do you want to do with your PLN? Is it to just gain information, to gain resources? Is it to exchange? Is it to have dialogue? Is it to up your game and to level up? That was part of my goal. I uh, invested in my PLN to level up and it really paid off. Uh, I'm doing things like this work with Dino right now. There's some future projects I have. I have the two podcasts now and we'll see what I have in the future. And it really helped me get my new position uh, because I had such a bolstering PLN. I was able to get letters of recommendation from uh, people who are kind of standouts in the educational field, like Jamie Donnelly. She wrote me a great letter of recommendation. She's an expert in uh, AR, VR technologies. And then Rochelle Denae Poth also gave me a recommendation. She's an expert in just kind of like all things at ed tech education um, and does a lot of work with ISTE and artificial intelligence. And then also I got a recommendation from uh, the former uh, chief learning officer of Q, uh, which is an ISTE affiliate um, from John Carippo. So that was great. And he's also the author of Edu Protocols 1 and 2, which are great books. I recommend you check those out as well. So with this goal, 
once you have it down, then you can leverage it and figure out what your next steps are going to be. And it's okay if you don't know what that is. Uh, initially, when I got on social media, uh, before I was focused on it, I really didn't have a goal. I just knew I kind of needed to be on. And I would say, hopefully after this, um, you'll have a better idea of, of where to go. There's kind of four modes, uh, I would say, um, four models of engaging with your PLN. The first stage is a lurker stage. So this would be just going around, looking at content, um, liking, and maybe not even really conversing or just leaving little comments. Um, on social media and just taking what you need, but not really contributing or looking to develop relationships on social media. The next stage or model would be the chameleon. So this is somebody who is starting to interact more and they're really copying and putting into practice what they're seeing on social media. And so if you see a certain type of language being used, a certain type of sentence structure or um, use of emojis, things like that, or bitmojis even in postings, uh, you're starting to adapt. And then next is the innovator. So the innovator is somebody that really shares out good, solid content, but maybe they're lacking some branding, maybe they're not engaging with the audience so much, but what they have is solid gold in terms of what they're sharing out. And then there's the influencer. So this is somebody that kind of has everything. Uh, they have great communication skills, great branding. They also bring a lot to the table in terms of innovation and what they're sharing out. So it's not a lot of uh, reposting. It's a lot of original content or a blend. Um, so keep that in mind. If you really want to be a social media influencer, you have to have a lot of original content and make some time to be on social media so that you can respond to people. That's really going to bolster uh, your following. So take a moment, think about what is your social media persona? Like, where are you at right now? And where would you like to be? And it's okay if you're at one stage and you want to stay there. That's totally okay. It's really up to you because social media is all about fulfilling what you need. But I do highly encourage you to share out because you never know who's going to benefit. I didn't think initially that what I had to offer was substantial or uh, could be of use, uh, especially when I was just starting out in education. I had no idea that veteran teachers would like what I had out there and would even consider using it. And you know what? They used it. And uh, so many opportunities came. For example, uh, I was able to present, uh, well, not present, but MC rather, uh, a stage at uh, an event called Mindfair. And that all came from a connection from my PLN, Glenn Irvin, the host of the On Education podcast. Uh, he helped me get on social media and he connected me with Steve Isaacs and Steve needed some volunteers and uh, he graciously put me and my family up so I could uh, help out with this event. And we were able to make a great family vacation out of it. And I also got to learn a a lot about being on stage and uh, being around big crowds. Uh, there were 10,000 people in attendance there. So uh, I really had this great experience uh, because I was open to my PLN and I kind of put myself out there and I was open to a new experience. Uh, it was really neat. And if you want to hear a little bit about that, I do have an episode with Steve Isaacs on the TNT Tech podcast. Uh, some basic principles of social media. Now, depending on who you talk to, they're going to have different principles. Uh, but these are my five core principles that I recommend you follow. Keeping things professional. It's really important. If you want to have a personal social media account, I recommend you create a separate professional one that really isn't tied to it. Uh, we have to be really careful 
uh, with what we post. Uh, it can be tied to our job, as we've seen with some uh, celebrity-like or high-profile individuals. Same is true in education. So if something um, is a little racy, uh, I just wouldn't post it. There are people that do that, and that's part of their brand. Uh, that's not me, and I think you're taking a huge risk. Uh, if you're doing something like that. Next, be kind and courteous, especially with how things are. I know Katie talked about uh, masks versus non-masks, things like that. Uh, keep it really neutral, respectful, kind, courteous. Even if you are really opinionated one way or another, uh, I would save that more for private conversations and not necessarily something in the big public forum because it could work against you. Uh, even if you think you're, you're doing something very noble, uh, you could end up paying a price that you're not really willing to pay. And it, it's hard to kind of foresee the future and figure out uh, what's going to be acceptable years from now. Uh, we're seeing that a lot on social media as well. Next, I always recommend that people are uplifting. You may have noticed already in my presentation, I've given some shout outs to people. That's kind of my thing. I, I feel like we are genuinely better together and it's really important to acknowledge others and the great work they're doing. And uh, like a great team, uh, together we achieve more. Um, everybody achieves more uh, when we work together. And just because somebody is successful in an area doesn't mean you can't be and celebrating their success only helps you out. Um, you know, it's not to a detriment. That's something that I've learned in life transitioning from a graphic designer to somebody in the educational field. And um, next, don't engage in trolling behavior. If people are trolling your page, you know, just leave it be you know, mute the conversation, you can take down the post. It's much easier than uh, engaging in some uh, long fought uh, conversation. So watch out for that. That's something that's really popular right now. And then uh, remember what you post is forever. So be really cautious and mindful. Uh, when in doubt, don't share it out. Uh, just wait on it. You can even check with your PLN. Like, hey, I'm thinking about sharing this out. What do you guys think? So if it's questionable, I recommend you get some advice on that. Uh, here are some social media platforms to focus on. I'm gonna talk about my experience with them briefly and then share out some, some pros and possible cons. So Twitter, this is my favorite. If you had to pick one, this is the one I would pick because it's the more like it's the most holistic one. It kind of covers all of the areas. So many educators are on there. So specifically for education and business, I would go with Twitter. Your energies are best well spent here. I also wouldn't try and do them all. It, it becomes quite overwhelming. Um, I had a lot of success. I just focused for a solid year on Twitter alone. And I gained about 4,500 followers. It's not necessarily all about the follow follows and followers and all of that um, but it can be a good metric so I felt like that was exponential growth within that year and it really paid dividends uh, it's also how I was able to spread the word of my podcast um, I thought only you know family and friends were going to listen I thought ah this first episode uh, 10 people are going to listen and within two days we had 100 listens. I thought, wow, this is amazing. And we've been going strong ever since. So it hasn't let up and it just continues to grow and grow and grow. Um, and it's awarded me great opportunities to speak with speakers like Alice Killer, Catlin Tucker, Matt Miller. Um, and then um, hopefully I'll get Dave Burgess and some other folks on there as well. So um, feel free to check out the guest list. Um, I like the meaningful conversations I'm able to have in the direct message feature, but also in the educational chats and just um, direct messages and, you know, posting things and, and talking in there. Um, it, it's really nice. I'm able to 
uh, convey my message, convey what I want to say, uplift others, and also be uplifted. Um, nothing makes my day like somebody retweeting a post uh, that I've shared out. So I really like that. And then, uh, you know, it is a blend of kind of all the other social medias. Uh, Facebook, I think this one is best for groups, especially educational groups. And then it's really good for cross branding. So you could take something that you've posted on Twitter or Instagram and share it out very easily on Facebook. Same with YouTube or LinkedIn. You could take one of your posts from there, screenshot it, and reshare it out on Facebook. And there isn't a character limit, which is really nice. It's also blended, but it tends to be geared a little bit more towards older audiences. And so you may miss out on some of the younger educators coming up. And then I do like the live chats on there, the live stream feature. It's really neat to engage with audiences there. So if that's something you want to do, like webinars, um, that would be a good spot to go. Uh, Instagram, it's highly visual. If you have a lot of um, visuals, graphics, tutorials, and video format to share out, if you like to communicate via video, uh, this is a great space. Somebody that does that really well is Tim Cavey from Teachers on Fire. And then if you want to share out in the Instagram stories, uh, a good group to model would be the Teach Better team. So Ray Hewart and Jeff Gargas do a fantastic job with this. And what's really nice about this is because they're owned by Facebook, you can then just quickly and easily post to Facebook at the same time. It doesn't look so great on Twitter, so be aware of that. You may have to reformat, or what I'll do sometimes is I'll record a video and just upload separately uh, to both platforms, and I'll do it that way. But the live chats on there are great, and this tends to uh, appeal to uh, like Gen Z millennials a little bit more than the older crowd. Uh, LinkedIn. I, I love the per professionalism here. It's highly professional. You can have some really deep conversations. If you're wanting to engage in LinkedIn, I recommend you read some of the articles, put a nice in-depth post, and you're gonna start getting a lot of follows, a lot of comments on that. Um, share deep content. You can share out uh, slide decks in the form of PDFs on there. I got that tip from Saba Kidwai. Uh, she's um, an educator out of California and she has some great stuff on LinkedIn and she gave me that pro tip. Um, that's also really good for getting jobs. Recommend you keep your resume up to date and whatever you do. So if you're presenting, you come up with some new training, uh, share it out on there if you're able, unless you're district prohibits that. Uh, that's really great. That also helped me get some interviews um, and get my new position that I'm really enjoying. Uh, YouTube. This one is tricky. Do not expect quick results. They are very, very rare on YouTube, but that doesn't mean that you can't be successful or share out on YouTube. So I'll be honest, I don't share a lot out on YouTube because I'm not so patient. Uh, this is like the long game um, in terms of time investment. You have to be really dedicated, put out a lot of content, probably at least 18 months before you start seeing some returns on the content you're posting. I use this for uh, reposting a lot of my district trainings and I kind of just leave it at that. But I do have some plans in the future to share out specialized content um, that is directly tied with the podcast or kind of dovetail. So uh, keep your eye out on that for me in the next year or so. And you can monetize this pretty easily. So that is an appeal. Uh, there are some teachers that have been really successful with that. Uh, Rap Reynolds is one channel. Uh, Mr. DeMaio is another one that have done well. Uh, I believe they're into like the millions of views. When you start getting into the millions of views on something, that's when um, you start doing well in terms of monetization. But you have to have at least 400 hours of content to even be able to monetize. So keep that in mind. 
Uh, next, this is one I'm really excited about. Uh, Steve Isaacs, who I mentioned earlier, along with Mike Washburn, uh, who's uh, another host of the On Education podcast, through the company uh, Participate, have created a Twitch channel, and they're doing all kinds of educational things, like showing people how to do certain things in Minecraft, and just having educational roundtables, if you will, talking about current issues, things that we're talking about right now in the coaches workshop. Uh, this is great because the market threshold is really low in terms of educators getting into this. And I'm really excited to uh, kind of dip my toes into this in the next year and use it to share tutorials, have conversations, and to kind of give walkthroughs of things, how I would um, use certain programs, give certain trainings, and then share those out live where people can ask questions. Uh, and uh, this is really nice because many educators have Amazon Prime. Well, one kind of thing they have with Twitch is this partnership where you can gift a Prime subscription. And so you as um, the, the Twitch, um, you know, channel can get some money that way easily and it's not costing the educator extra money to help support you so think of it as like a patreon uh kind of feature with twitch and there are some different things like bits uh, that can do there and what's nice is you know it's experimental right now so throw some ideas out there try it out see if it works um you'll never know until you try it out so uh don't fear dipping into that. Here's this Eric Qualman quote that I talked about. The time to build a PLN is before you need it. So I experienced this with graphic design when the recession hit uh, 2008, 2009. I found myself without a job and I was really struggling, did freelancing a lot, but it was really hard. I didn't have that, that network ahead of time. And so people who did have that network were the ones getting all the jobs I had to fight tooth and nail. And I just wasn't very successful for that, that reason. And so when I got into education, I learned from that mistake and I really started developing that PLN right away. And I encourage you to do so as well. Uh, as we kind of start to close, I want you to focus on your why, like why you do what you do, why you're in education. I think most of us are in education, uh, you know, as a sense of duty and love for our fellow man and for our students, right? We want what's best for them and we want to help our students and our communities actualize their potential. I would say that's what makes educators on Twitter so great because we generally have the same why and that's to help other people out. And so don't be afraid to share what you have. Just give it a test. See what people say. Throw it out there. Say, hey, throwing this out. Give me some feedback. Let me know. Tag me. Tag some other people. I'll be more than happy to retweet it out for you. Um, and this is uh, Simon Sinek, he's the author of this book, Start With Why. It's been a bestseller. I have a link to his TED Talk uh, video here. I encourage you to watch it. He explains it in more detail. But to know where you're going, you have to start with your why. And the next step, um, after you have your why and you know what it is, is the how. How are you going to actualize this plan of yours? And I recommend you kind of come up with a battle plan, if you will, like your next steps, what you're going to do. Uh, so your next steps should be to follow some hashtags, trends, join chats, and engage in meaningful conversations. And think about what you can share. It could be anything. Uh, just keep it professional. And thank you so much for listening today. Follow me on Twitter at Mr. Noons Teach. On Instagram, I'm at I am Mr. Ed Tech, and follow my podcasts. I have the websites down below. Um, thank you so much.
Thank you, Scott. I think um, the PLN is so powerful, especially in education. Um, you know, as educators, we all share out information on a daily basis. So I think myself having worked with educators, it's it's amazing to see how much information everyone has to share and how much they want to share with others. So I think the power of the PLN is endless, especially with social media. So thank you for walking through that. Um, we had a question come in asking if you could share the bit.ly again for your presentation. Yeah. Would you mind putting that in the chat? Yeah, I'll put that in the chat. Perfect. Thank you. Um, we will take a, maybe a few questions at the end if we have time, but I am going to pass it off to Nicole now. Um, Nicole, if you want to put your video on. Um, wonderful. So, Nicole, I know we've worked with you in the past. Um, you're also a Dino customer at Richland, so it's great to have you here again with us. Um, yes. I will pass it off to you. All right, fantastic. I'm going to um, share my screen. Just be sure that um, you can see it. Um, hopefully you can. I'm just going to give you guys some Yes, just we can see it. Your plans. Perfect. Okay, so um, I do want to back up just a little bit. Um, Katie did some great um, kind of leeway from our initial when we went into this um, pandemic and shut down in that. And um, just to give you guys kind of an idea where we're going um, in the future with it. So when we um, abruptly shut down, we knew that our teachers, especially in the elementary level, we're really going to need some training on that Google Classroom and Google Meet. Most of them did not use Google Classroom um, in the primary grades because they're not one-to-one -one yet, um, but they are going to be now. So um, really the beginning, we had to do that initial kind of tech training um, and really get them kind of ready. We, we ended up um, really looking at our instructional model and what that instructional model looks like um, on an, uh, in the e-learning environment, and it really was the same. It was just gonna be the strategies and the delivery that was going to be changed. So we ended up doing some um, training, um, which was not mandatory at the time, but coming in um, and looking at each of those components with teachers and giving them some strategies and really looking at how they're going to design lessons um, that are going to work both in the classroom and outside, because we know next year there's a, very strong possibility that we could be going in and out. And so just learning how to design with that end in mind. Uh, and so in creating all of those intentional learning activities that kind of build up to an end product. And so from there this summer, our team of five um, went and created and developed a three part series that all of our teachers are required to do this summer. Um, and so we are in the midst of all of this training. We have two, about 2,000, just over 2,000 teachers that we are working with um, every week. They uh, come in for an hour on a Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And on Tuesday, we really focused on that designing online learning, what we kind of did in the um, in March and April time, looking at that again, that instructional model, ending with the, or starting with the end in mind and looking at how those components go into it. Um, the second day, we look at just e-learning best practices what is synchronous learning? What is asynchronous learning? What are the strategies and tools that are gonna make this work? And then um, we look at differentiated instruction. We look at uh, collaboration. What does that look like in, um, in an online environment? And really keeping in that mind that designing those things and designing and giving opportunities to learn the tools and that because we are going to be in and out next year. And so we've gotta be able to design um, all of our learning activities and goals um, with that in mind. Um, our last session that we do with our teachers each week is managing online learning because um, we want teachers to know that there are still norms and expectations that we have um, in that type of environment. You establish those in the beginning of the year with your students in the classroom. So what are some things that you want to be able to um, ensure you're telling your students and reminding your students? We really talk a lot about digital citizenship and how important it is just to get them because they are going to be online. We cannot assume that students know what they're supposed to do. They are learning. Um, and so we do talk a lot about that digital citizenship component just so then the uh, teachers are able to um, help support the, um, the learning environment no matter which way we go. Um, specifically for our elementary, um, as we designed this three-part series, uh, we learned that we were going to be going one-to-one -one kindergarten and first grade and second grade. The, um, we were three through 12, but now we are K through 12. So 
we knew our teachers needed that technology tool specific training. So um, we do an hour session each day with the elementary and then we follow it up with um, there's six different choices of tools that they can go in and we lead a training um, along with our coaches because we do have um, the, a, a great opportunity in Richland too that we have a technology and learning coach at all of our schools. So they've done all of this training. We've coached with them um, to be able to help support the teachers um, as they're moving into the um, the, the new school year. So, but we do have six different technology um, trainings There's uh, that are essential for um, doing all of the uh, instruction. It could be Google Classrooms, definitely one Google Meet, because we knew our teachers in the kindergarten first grade last year were not using it because they didn't have the technology at the time. So we've really thought about what they were going to need um, in order to make that next year transition go smoothly. So it is something that's required for all the teachers. Um, we, you know, I talked about the elementary secondary is just doing the three uh, series, but we are providing technology specific training sessions throughout the month of July for teachers that are not familiar, say with Flipgrid, with, um, with Google Classroom because we do get new teachers. So we know that we need to be able to support them as well. Our admin, we're also required to take the series because we want them to know what to look for. We want them to know um, how they can be supporting their teachers. And um, they have been found it very valuable because they can have that conversation and they know what the, the teachers are going to be kind of expected to do. Um, because when we went in last year, um, we were kind of uh, building the plane as we were flying, uh, kind of building those expectations and those guidelines. And we've really taken that feedback um, from the end of the year from teachers, from parents, students, and really trying to figure out what we're going to do to provide those expectations for everybody in there. We are doing um, a special series with our SPED uh, program because that does, that was one area that we have learned a lot about with our um, they needed that support. What does that look like? Um, our ESOL, um, that became a, um, a barrier that we saw. It was much bigger, that equity issue. And so we've really started developing a lot of those parent websites that uh, allow our non-English speaking parents that, you know, when they're at home, they weren't able to support. So we're trying to give that support for them, teaching them how to um, use the tools, um, you know, make those accommodations and such to, in order to make that um, type of learning work for our, um, for everybody in the district. So we also, in, in back of March, we did create an e-learning toolkit, knowing that um, teachers do learn at their own pace. And uh, so we created a, a little toolkit with all those kind of essential Google or Google for Ed districts. So everything Google and just whatever tools we were going to be mentioning in this training, um, Flipgrid, we use VoiceThread, just so then they were able to go in, learn the tools on their own if we weren't going to be able to, um, if they couldn't attend one of the trainings. So that's kind of where we are right now and what we build, but what's coming up is gonna definitely be more training. Um, we get teachers um, you know, in the middle of the year, so we're really gonna need to have some sort of a support system for them. Um, and we do want to continue that three-part series um, as those new teachers come in. Uh, we are um, going to go with Edgenuity as a platform. And so that's gonna be something completely brand new to the district. And so we do have to kind of build that capacity so teachers are comfortable using that tool for them. Uh, we do uh, host a great conference um, in, it was a two day, it is now down to one and we're doing it virtual and we're very excited about it. And, most of our teachers will probably take um, the opportunity to go to that free conference just because we've got um, Eric Kurtz coming in for the day or for the morning sessions and then lots of other teachers that are going to be presenting, sharing those ideas um, and just sending out the, those technology strategies, instructional strategies that kind of work from them. So we have um, really you know, revamped our conference that we've had for the last nine years. So. And then we're looking at how we're going to really support our TLCs coming in. We have four new TLCs that are starting um, in August. So we do need to provide some um, training, specific training that's going to help them to learn how to coach, um, how to work with the, the teachers to support them, um, 
how to provide those professional learning opportunities, if it's going to be online through a Google Meet, or if it's going to be if we are in the face-to-face -face once in a while. So we're really going to be looking at um, building more capacity in our coaches that we already have, but also thinking about what we're going to need to do to support the, the brand new TLCs coming in that were from the classroom. I think the great opportunity that these particular TLCs have is that experience teaching. Um, they, they were in the trenches in March up through June, so they'll be able to really have that supportive niche to, to the teachers when they start working with them uh, come uh, August. So, but that's about it. Um, if you have any questions, uh, let me know. Um, or if I need to elaborate on any of them. Um, yeah, so Nikki Tom had a question um, asking, what does your SPED specific training look like? If you might uh, be able to dive a little bit deeper into that. So they do also take that three-part series. Um, they were, you know, just so then they're aware of how to design those lessons, kind of those expectations, because they do need to, we want some consistency, a lot of, you know, consistency across the board. So we do have that. Uh, and once they've taken those ones and they take, a, um, there'll be a two, I'm trying to remember because that's the part, uh, it's a three hour training session on Monday. We're starting it actually next Monday is our first one where they are going to get the technology kind of training, the tool training, and then they are, whatever their actual SPED capacity is, if it's the, um, if it's in the behavior realm, if it's um, more cognitive, they're actually doing more of their own training within that department. Um, and I didn't have a, part, a chance to work with them on that part. We were just doing that technology because a lot of them do not use technology in, in their classroom with the resource in that. So they wanted to be able to have some more of that technology, how to use it, what does that look like? So, and I'm sure because we do always, um, ask for feedback um, each time we have, a, you know, in our three-part series, we do ask for feedback. I am sure that it'll be built on even more depending on what they're going to need, so. Wonderful, well, that's a really um, kind of thorough plan that you have for the summer and next semester, so thank you for laying that out. I think it ties in really well with the feedback and PLN portions that Katie and Scott talked about. Um, Katie, Scott, would you all mind turning on your camera, or your videos and unmuting? Um, so I, we don't have a ton of questions, but I would love to just do a little wrap up question um, from my own side. So I think one thing that's been kind of proven by this distance learning and remote learning period is that regardless of what school looks like when we go back in the fall, technology is going to be a huge part of it. Um, and I would just ask all of you, what's one piece of advice you would give to tech coaches or teachers um, with this increased you know, use of technology, more teachers using technology, students being more autonomous? What's one piece of advice to give to them for, I guess, preparing for that in the fall? Excellent question. <laughs> <laughs> um, for, for me, I see a lot of teachers that hesitate to, to let the technology sort of, they feel like it's taking over and it makes them feel less needed and less important. And, I, and my advice is to not feel that way because you're actually more important because you're their own, going to be their human or interaction that they need and their support. And, and it really does shift your role. Instead of the holder of the information, you're really shifting into a coach for the student and you're there for their support. Um, and so don't be afraid of it as it, it's tough because I know how they feel. <laughs> <laughs> and for me, I would say, uh, give yourself some grace, you know, uh, mistakes are going to be made and give others grace too. Uh, we have to be really <laughs> forgiving and patient with one another. It, it's just a different time. This is uncharted territory right now. And also leverage your PLN, share those ideas out, share out what your district is doing. Maybe you're doing something that's really going to help somebody else out and maybe you can benefit from collaborating with another district or another tech coach or another person that's doing something like you're doing. So don't be afraid, take some risks. 
Yes, those are all great things. And I kind of want to piggyback and just kind of being transparent. I, we interviewed teachers last year as we were doing our training or leading up to the training. And one teacher said that uh, she, I haven't tried this. We're going to try it. And if we fail, it's okay. We're going to learn from it. And so she was transparent with her students. She was transparent with her parents. And she just kept that communication between all of those parties there so then they, if there was a change this is the change because it, it did fail so it is okay <laughs> fail forward you know mm -hmm. fail forward everybody it's we're all learning this together so definitely um we actually did have one question come in i know it's one o'clock but i'd love to answer it really quickly um so it's from sue and she said once teachers learn the components of distance learning lessons such as flipgrid etc how are teachers learning to up their game in terms of good online lesson design from areas of engagement standards not having cognitive overload differentiation etc are we at that evaluation level yet? So whoever wants to take that question, um, feel free. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, we, um, I, I think that it is hard because learning comes first, it's the technology second, and then the way that if we're in that remote learning, um, it's just inevitable. I think that uh, for when I work with teachers, we do start with, um, let's try this Flipgrid, say, we'll use, somebody had used it as an example, and do it not just about the content, do something fun because you do want to build community with your students in the classroom, even if you are in the remote learning. So providing those opportunities. Um, and then once you've gotten comfortable with it, um, we use the design with the end in mind, and so we are always very intentional with how you design those lessons with that end product in mind and um, pulling in our instructional model at the different components and when technology fits, you bring it in. If it's going to enhance that experience, we bring it in. If it doesn't, then it becomes something else, whatever makes sense for it. I hope I answered that one, but anybody no. can chime in. And I would just add, um, I would double down on what you said. If the tool doesn't fit, even though I love Flipgrid, if it's not going to get you the outcome um, that you want, then don't use Flipgrid. And uh, sometimes uh, digital tools, even though I love them, I'm a huge EdTech guy, I named my podcast after EdTech, uh, sometimes it just doesn't fit. And an in-person or a, a traditional model will work better. So I think it's more about using the right tool for the job and nothing. There is no tool out there or series of tools that does everything. You do have to pick and choose. Mm -hmm. So be aware of that. Yeah, and the only thing I would really add is like that question had a long list of things to tackle mm -hmm. and you can't tackle all of them at the same time without losing your mind and never sleeping. So, you know, pick and choose what is the most important thing that you want to focus on and, and work on that first and, and build from there. Cause just like when we first start teaching, anyone, you know, anyone that's been a teacher before knows their first year was not the same as their second or third or fourth or, fourth or fifth. Um, so, you know, just with anything, pick and choose and, and focus on a couple or one or two things and not everything. Oh, great answers. I'm a huge, huge fan of the crawl, walk, run approach, especially in circumstances where you don't really know what you're dealing with. So great advice. Peace in each of your respective areas. And got a lot of great information from you. Everyone enjoyed uh, joining us today for the workshop. So again, if people could share their um, social channels to engage with us that would be awesome and i hope everyone has a wonderful weekend thank you all again thanks everybody thank you for having thank us. You. Yeah. take care thank you bye